Is Donald Trump's immigration policy America first or America last? This is the question that a lot of people are asking themselves after Trump made a recent appearance on the All In podcast, a very eminent political program, where he made a quite, to many people, surprising statement about how he believes American companies can remain competitive and keep good talent in our country to enrich our economic sector. Why? And what I wanted to do, and I would have done this, but then we had to solve the COVID problem because that came in and, you know, sort of dominated for a little while, as you perhaps know. But what I want to do and what I will do is you graduate from a college. I think you should get automatically as part of your diploma, a green card to be able to stay in this country. And that includes junior oh. colleges, too. Anybody graduates from a college, you go in there for two years or four years. If you graduate or you get a doctorate degree from a college, you should be able to stay in this country. And you know more stories than I do, but I know of stories where people graduated from a top college or from a college and they desperately wanted to stay here. They had a plan for a company, a concept, and they can't. They go back to India. They go back to China. They do the same basic company in those places and they become multi-billionaires employing thousands and thousands of people, and it could have been done here. Well, that response that you saw, that he was allow people to get green cards if they graduate from college, has elicited a massive backlash from across the right. There are plenty of people on social media who have been reacting by either saying that Donald Trump has sold out to whatever nefarious force is making him sell out, uh, which is quite unclear to me. There are some that are saying that Donald Trump does not care about preserving American culture from foreigners. There are others that are saying that Donald Trump has officially become the herald of the America last position, which was endemic to our American system for the past 30 or so years under the auspices of the neocons and their adventurism, both economic adventurism and military adventurism, which both went hand in hand, by the way, across the world. And while I think these responses are, I think, necessary to start a conversation, many of them are actually missing the deeper significance of what Trump is saying. And they are actually simplifying his immigration policy program to an extent where it can be straw manned and attacked without it being given any charitability whatsoever. So on this video, I will be addressing that. I'll be trying to work through some of the assumptions that are inherent in the arguments being made and also some of the assumptions that are inherent in Trump's policy proposal. But, 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 but before we get to that point, hello, hello, hello everyone. I am Christian Watson. I am your host. If you enjoy political and social commentary with a philosophical bent, then I of course must encourage you to like this video, comment on this video, subscribe to this channel. Uh, and even if you disagree with me, because disagreement is the most important part of a civil and functioning society, and it is an indispensable aspect in the process of truth seeking that I seek to inspire all of you to go on if you've not gone it already, or to continue if you've already gone down that venerable path. So please, please, please be sure to subscribe. Now onto the video. So whenever we see these instances that can be taken out of context or clipped in social media, we should always ask ourselves, what is the bigger picture? Which is why I didn't have a particular overreaction to this, because I immediately, when I heard Trump say this, I immediately went to his website and looked at his immigration policy. See, there's a difference between an offhand comment made on a podcast and the actual immigration policy, the underlying ethos of your campaign. So I'll take you all through what this policy says on his, on his website, DonaldJTrump.com, under the section Secure Borders and Reclaiming National Sovereignty, which explicitly addresses Trump's sentiments on the issue of immigration. It says, quote, President Donald J. Trump created the most secure border in U.S. history, which is actually true if you think about it, because illegal immigrant crossings, while they were still up under him, they were the lowest under him than they had been for a very, very long time. And under Biden, there's millions of people that are crossing, which is an absolute reverse trend from the Trump record. Just looking at it objectively. Continue. He ended catch and release, took down human traffickers, and deported record numbers of illegal alien gang members, and built 450 miles of powerful new wall. Do Joe Biden turned our country into one giant sanctuary for dangerous criminal aliens. Of course, he goes on and on and on and on about Joe Biden. But then he says, in offering a prescription to solve for Biden's issues, he says, quote, President Trump will shut down Biden's border disaster. He will again end catch and release. He will restore remain in Mexico and eliminate asylum fraud. Now, for those of you who are schooled in this, you'll understand that 
one of the biggest issues with asylum seekers is that they can come in the country, claim they are from a country that has a bad political situation, uh, apply for asylum. They are then given papers. They are released from the detention centers that they were in, and they are allowed to go throughout the country unmonitored uh, uh, until their court date, some of which the court dates are decades ahead or the court dates will never happen due to backlog. That's a problem. And even if you are pro-immigration, that's a problem because this actually ultimately harms the ability of immigrants that love America to come into America and to enrich our culture because there are people that have taken up spots, that have taken up space, and that are not being held accountable to the same rules those immigrants are supposed to be held accountable towards. So Trump is talking about this in his policy prescription. He also says, in cooperative states, President Trump will deputize the National Guard and local law enforcement to assist with rapidly removing illegal alien gang members and criminals. He will also, and this is going to be significant for the comments we're addressing in this video, quote, he will also deliver a merit-based immigration system that protects American labor and promotes American values. That is the most important aspect of this policy prescription. Now, of course, many of you may say, Christian, this is vague. But here's the thing. Even if it is general and speaking in generalities, this still exemplifies the ethos of the Trump position on immigration. So we now have to ask ourselves the question, in light of this, in light of wanting to take down illegal alien gang members, in light of wanting to rein in the asylum system to ensure that people are accountable to come in our country, because that's been one of the biggest causes of the migrant crisis, in light of wanting to have a merit-based system that still considers the needs of American labor, i.e. America first, in light of all of these different policy points, we have to really ask ourselves, how in the world can Trump be considered America last? Well, we now have to get into the philosophical portion of this video where we ask ourselves, what does it actually mean to be America first? Many of you may say to me, well, Christian, this question must be rhetorical because it is actually quite simple. To be America first means you put our people first. Okay, fair enough. What does that mean? What does it mean to put our people first? And this is where a lot of people just go blank or they don't dig deep or they will offer me another simplified anecdote that only addresses the question in a half-portioned way. They will then say, uh, in terms of how America should act on the global stage, that the considerations of the American people should be placed before the considerations of any other people. All right, I think that's actually a very good way to express one pillar of the America First paradigm, but there are still several other pillars that intersect with different domains that, le that are left unaddressed by that statement. But I agree. America first, in the sense of foreign policy, is a moral position that stems from the national obligation that our politicians are supposed to have to the people and not to entangling alliances, not to global partnerships, not to multinational groups that wish to take America away from its borders and invest it in other countries that are not our own. That is one pillar of the America first project. But when I ask this question in a more broader sense, that explanation does not suffice when talking about economics. Because in this globally interconnected economic world, which by the way, the interconnected global economy is partially what made America a superpower with economic prowess beyond any other country in the world at this moment, although we're, we're declining most certainly. China's catching up, Russia's catching up, but still, we're declining. But for centuries, we were the dominant superpower because of that interconnected economy and because of the power of free trade. So you have to ask yourself, in terms of the economic domain, what does it mean to be America first? Does it mean that you're going to only hire and buy American? I think it's actually a good sensibility to have, buy American and hire American, but that cannot be your complete economic philosophy because America, if we understand the economic principles of comparative and absolute advantage, America is simply one country with one people that have a particular set of skills that can be leveraged and should be leveraged for the benefit of our country, but you cannot leverage those skills for every other area, for every other skill set. This is why comparative and to absolute advantage are concepts in economics that must be observed. So it actually is America first to ensure that we have people, even if they're from other countries, to enrich our current economic skill set, to enrich our current productivity skill set, and to bring in skills 
that may have otherwise gone lost simply by relying on the domestic population. Now, this does not mean that it is absolutely useless for us to have an American-centered labor policy. In fact, we should have an American-centered labor policy for the reason that we should have a, a, for, a foreign policy that's also centered on ensuring the needs of our people are put ahead of the needs of others. In my opinion, the best way to go about this, if I'm going to just talk about what I think rather than what Trump or what other people think, the best way to go about this is to have a policy of merit-based immigration that focuses on high-skilled immigration, not low-skilled, because low-skilled immigration has a very different effect on communities and on people than high-skilled immigration does. Have a merit-based policy focused on high-skilled immigration, but then tie that policy to the needs of the American worker. Let me explain more. See, when you're talking about bringing in other people to enhance our current labor set, we shouldn't have a situation where, where highly skilled Americans are now competing against highly skilled Indians or highly skilled uh, Singaporeans or highly skilled Australians. That shouldn't be the case. What should be the case is this. We have a policy of merit. We say, okay, if there are, let's say there are, there are 10 engineers from, from Nebraska, who have the ability to do good on bridges and do good on a project. But there are also 10 engineers from Singapore who have that same ability. Now let's say if we look at them on the basis of merit, they are equal. All things are equal. They have a similar level of skill and accomplishment and, and having either of them work on the project will not be deleterious and it will not be extraordinarily beneficial. It'll just be around the same result. If that's the case, the American worker ought to be prioritized. Now, let's say this. Let's say all things are equal except the Singaporean crew has some skills in some other area of engineering that actually might be beneficial for the American crew to enhance the sturdiness and the quality of the bridge they're building in this hypothetical example. Therefore, bringing them in would not only be good economically, it'd be good socially because we now have a structure that won't be dilapidated and falling apart or it'll last for longer. Well, then the Singaporean crew should definitely be considered at the very least, if not brought in. These, there are no, as a great economist once said, there are no solutions, there are just trade-offs. And when you're talking about economics, you must understand you're talking about a game of trade-offs in the economic sense. But in the moral sense, you're also talking about a game, right, of ensuring that people in society have the best possible way to enjoy the world by having what what is common sort of common things that the government has agreed to provide, even if they shouldn't be providing them, like bridges or whatever, ensure that those are working and just in a basic skill sense. And so you need to have people that are willing to be up for the job. Now, I, I think that there's a case for privatization of some of these projects. And I think that if privatization was actually part of the conversation here, the immigration issue would become less and less of a political issue and more and more of, a, of an economic issue. But that's a different story, different day. So to kind of tie all this together, there's another aspect of this that I want to address that is going unaddressed. And it's that a lot of people are, are ha on the right are having an overreaction to the excesses of the left on immigration. The left has proposed this policy of universal beneficence and of open borders that has essentially allowed our country to become little more than a backdrop for all the problems of the world, regardless of the needs of our own people. And in doing that, that has caused a lot of anger, a lot of justified righteous anger in the hearts of many Americans. And so we have to understand that this goes to a deeper problem of citizenship. Uh, American citizenship is perhaps the most unique category of citizenship in the world because American citizenship is not actually concerned with your economic status. It shouldn't be concerned with your legal status. It shouldn't be concerned with the country of origin. American citizenship is first and foremost a moral proposition. Now, some people will say that citizenship is a sort of contract with the dead. That's what Edmund Burke said. That's not true because the dead don't speak, right? The dead don't speak, and I have no obligation to the dead. I have an obligation to people that are living and with me right now in this world. Uh, I have a, I pro, I may, I may, it may be a good idea to listen to the advice of older generations, that's why I'm a conservative. I absolutely should listen to the advice of generations that passed before me, if that advice is good. If not, then it's crap, I'm not gonna listen to it. But citizenship is not a contract with the dead. 
citizenship is rather a expression of a worldview situated on sound axioms discovered by reason about both man's nature, how it relates to society, and the moral behavior which flows from the recognition of those two principles. That's what American citizenship is, at least. It's not based on blood and soil. It's not based on familial tradition. It's not based on divine right. It's not based on anything except the axioms of the American worldview, reason, popular sovereignty, consent. So when questions of immigration are brought forth, we have to ask ourselves, is there a way to shoehorn this worldview to those who wish to come into our country? Right? Assimilation only works if you understand the country you're assimilating to. So my preference would be, we have a merit-based immigration system, except that merit-based immigration system is going to also require a worldview test. And if people from other countries fail the worldview test, if they fail to affirm the premises of the American founding, if they fail to affirm the, the goodness and the righteousness of natural law and natural rights, if they fail to affirm the importance of reason as opposed to superstition as a, as, a, as a political value, if they fail to understand the proper domains of government, if they fail to understand the importance of community, which would all be included on that test, by the way, in this situation, they shouldn't be let into our country. People who are really worried about the preservation of America must understand what America is, or else they're not putting America first. They're putting their idea of America first, no matter how flawed that idea may be. Therefore, they are captured by a specter that is not reminiscent of the truth. It is instead a reminiscent of vain imaginations. There's a way to do immigration that does not harm the American worker and that only enhances American society. There's absolutely a way, but it must be done consciously, and it can only be done once we have dealt with the micro situation, once we have torn down the entitlement system, and once we have fully expressed as Americans our willingness to defend our unique worldview that has completely and utterly altered human history because it proposed a new but really an old idea about how humans are. That, go, that, that went to the core of our abilities and unlocked a flourishing unlike we, what we have ever seen before in this world. So that kind of immigration, worldview immigration, tied with merit, should be welcomed. Everything else, let's talk about it. So to close, I don't think Trump's policy is America first. I don't support just stapling green cards to people's diplomas. I don't support that. But if you look at his policy in a more long-form way, if you look at his policy in a more charitable way, it comes very clear. He's not talking about just handing out diplomas or handing out rather green cards with diplomas. He's talking about ensuring there is a merit-based system that enhances our ability as Americans to enjoy the things that we enjoy, to live good lives, and to have the best ex people, the best people with the most expertise in our nation. We ought to welcome that. We all have to recognize the dimensions of that, and we all have to celebrate that rather than get stuck in our mentality that he's talking about some kind of leftist universal benevolence construct of immigration, which he's not, and then oppose it with a knee-jerk reaction. Oftentimes, reactionary ideas are not sustaining ideas because reactionary ideas require people to believe that, that, that their first impressions are somehow the correct guide for a issue, when in all reality, it normally is the latter. Normally, the first impressions inform how you approach the issue, but they are later refined by thinking and by reason. And so I think that we ought to have a lot of that here. And so to answer the question of the video, no, his policy is not America last. It is America first with some need to understand what that phrase means to fully appreciate how it would manifest under the policy regime that he is suggesting. And so I humbly submit to all of you that is my answer. And I hope that more people don't get angry at, at this kind of stuff or don't have an knee-jerk reaction. Understand, appreciate, and deal with these things and the nuances they have. And together, I think that America First will become more than a slogan, more than a rhetorical fashion, and more so a statement of values that is reminiscent of what Jefferson and the Founding Fathers did when they established our great nation hundreds of years ago. My friends, like, share, comment, subscribe, do whatever you can to make this channel successful and to get this video out there. Uh, study history, 
Study philosophy, remain morally convicted, and please stay pensive.